Shalom, Avraim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino, and today we're doing our final part, part three, concerning the discussion about Hanukkah. But before we begin, let's start out with the blessing of salvation. Let's give all praise and glory and honor to Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, our Lord, our King, for he's the only way to the Father, and he gives eternal life. So if you know this blessing, go ahead and join in with me. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Natal Anoet Derech HaYeshua, O Mashiach, Yeshua Baruch Hu. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has made the way of salvation through the Messiah Yeshua. Blessed be his name. Amen. So welcome back, everyone, to our final part concerning our discussion with Hanukkah. Last time together, we talked about the victory that Judah Maccabee and his military had accomplished by taking back the temple grounds and rededicating the temple, also establishing a yearly holiday, which would be called Hanukkah or Festival of Lights or Feast of Dedication. And they decided that it would be eight days and we talked various reasons on why that was. And we also gave a little bit of the history concerning the leading up to the time of Yeshua after the victory of the Maccabean revolt. And what I would like to do now is do a little bit more history, just talk a few more minutes about that leading up to the time of Yeshua, because the main focus of today's teaching is on Yochanan, John chapter 10, and Yeshua's announcement being made at the time of Hanukkah. Now, before we get into the history, also, I would like to just correct myself. I misspoke in part two concerning the family line of Mattathias. So I would like to go ahead and make a correction here. So the family of the Maccabees were Hasmoneans or Asmoneans from the area of Judea in Hashman. And you can find that in Joshua, Yehoshua, chapter 15, verse 27. It gives you the name Hashman and how it was located in the area of Judea. Now, Mattathias was from the priestly order of Yehoyarib, Yehoyarib, the first order of the 24. Now, I had misspoke and said that he was from the line of Sadok, and that was a, miss, uh, a slip there, a misspeaking on my part. He is from the first order of the 24, okay? He is and you can find that in 1 Chronicles 24, 76. The very first order is Yeho Yarib. And that is the line or the priestly order line that Mattathias came from. So he's not from the line of Zadok, which disqualifies his family line from being eligible to be high priests. And we talked last time how after the Maccabean revolts, you are going to now begin to experience the family line of Mattathias taking on authority that was not given to them by the Torah. They will eventually announce themselves as both king and high priest. And for some 103 years, they will have what is called the Hasmonean dynasty, where they rule both as king and priest over the land of Jerusalem, Yer over the land of Israel. And we also talked how they also began to sweep through, and, and Judah Maccabee is the one that really began this, but others will take part in also doing this. But as they began to take back land from the Greeks and conquer villages, they began to force circumcision. They began to force proselytization of both Jews and Gentiles. And so they swing the pendulum far the other way. They go from experiencing Torah being outlawed, where you're put to death for circumcision and following the Torah, to swinging the pendulum the other way, to forcing people to bow down to the Torah and, and actually be forced to be circumcised and follow the Torah. So this is not something commanded of Yah to go around doing forced proselytization. That's not in the Torah. So they swing the pendulum the other way. So just wanted to kind of clarify some things here that yes, Yahweh gave them the victory. They could not have been given the victory unless it was by his power, by his authority, and by his grace and mercy. 
And I believe because Yeshua is Yahweh, he was there also giving them the victory, though he is distinct and separate from the Father. So um, it was definitely blessed by Yeshua also. And a holiday was created, which does not violate the scriptures. Okay, To create a tradition does not violate the scriptures at all. Now, you cannot hold it on equal grounds as one of the feasts or one of the Moedim that are mentioned in Leviticus, Vayikra, chapter 23. We can't hold it on equal ground, okay? So it is an optional tradition to celebrate, but I think it has great value. There's great value in it, which is what we're going to talk about more here today, because I do believe Yeshua celebrated Hanukkah. Now, a little bit more again in the history. Let's kind of talk about that leading up to the time of Yeshua. So in the Jewish Virtual Library, it states that Onias III, who held the office of high priest when Antiochus Epiphany succeeded to the throne in 175 BC, his son Onias IV was too young to succeed to his father's office, to which Jason, which is his brother, and Menelaus were successfully appointed by bribing the Seleucid ruler to appoint them. So they came into succession by bribery. And of course, we did talk about how the legitimacy of the high priest ceased to exist at that point. So even though Jason was from the proper line of Zadok, because he is Ananias's uh, brother, he only got the high priest position through bribery, all right? And so the Torah commands that Onias III should have been able to live out his whole days until he dies. Is he supposed to be the high priest? And so there was a breaking of Torah and a illegitimate taking of the high priest position by Jason. And from that point on, it never is the same. There never will be someone after Jason from the line of Zadok as high priest, okay? Even through the time of Yeshua, this is very important. All the way to the end of the destruction of the temple, there will never be a legitimate high priest in position according to the Torah. So after the retaking of the temple, uh, some believe that Judah of Maccabee is the high priest at that point, officiating things, he takes that position. Some might disagree, but from about 165 to 162 BC, and then after the death of Alcimus in 159, because he took it from 162 to 159, there is a seven-year vacancy, okay? The office remained vacant for seven years, and then the Maccabean Jonathan was nominated high priest by Alexander Bolus. okay? So Jonathan is the youngest of the five sons, so he's not from the correct line. He is from the line of Yehoiarib, okay, the first priestly order of the 24. And he's nominated by the Seleucid emperor at this time, or Seleucid king, Alexander Bolas, which is the third successor from Antiochus IV, okay? Then Simon, the oldest of the five sons of Mattathias, John, Jonathan's successor, was the high priest which irrevocably transferred from the Zadokites to the Hasmoneans. So at the time Simon takes the position of high priest, it's really kind of made known, it's really kind of uh, going to be established that those from the line of Zadok are not going to be in that position anymore, at least not for a long, long time, right? But we know that it never happens again. So the Hasmonean dynasty really starts to begin to kick off here. Uh, soon there will be someone that will proclaim themselves both king and high priest. Now, this seems to have given the appropriate occasion for the crystallization of the Dead Sea sect. Okay, this Dead Sea sect out at the Qumran area, it is said that they are priests from the line of Zadok. And so when this all starts occurring, where they see the Hasmonean dynasty really kicking off and they're taking the high priest position, because it's an illegitimate move on them and it's against Torah 
they begin to pull away from Yerushalayim, pull away from the priestly order that is operating there, and they migrate themselves out to the Dead Sea area. And this is where we get the Qumran community, who begin to really um, call themselves the sons of light because they feel like they are the legitimate ones to be high priest and that they are following the Torah correctly. Uh, and they can't be involved in that defilement that's going on there in Yerushalayim. And so they begin to call themselves the sons of light and everyone else, even the, uh, the Jews that are in Yerushalayim are sons of darkness. If you're not a part of the Qumran community, you're not a son of light. They're out there waiting for the Messiah. They know some of the prophetic prophecies that are spoken above the Messiah coming out from the desert area, which is why we have uh, Yochanan the Immerser out there preaching, paving the way. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why that Qumran community is out in the desert, getting themselves ready for the coming Messiah. They want to be ready for him. So, so the sect probably originated with a group of priests deeply disturbed by prevailed trends, especially in the high priest. The Hasmoneans were considered usurpers, and the sect maintained the exclusive right of the Zadokites to fill the high priestly position. All right, so now in general, it took more than two decades of fighting, though, for the Maccabees forced, before the Maccabees forced the Seleucids to retreat from the land of Israel. So there's a lot of fighting going on even after they take the temple back. Just taking the temple back did not end the fighting. Okay. That can kind of surprise a lot of people. By this time, Antiochus has died and his successor agreed to the Jews' demand for independence. This is the third successor, Alexander Bolas. So Alexander, all right, so we have Antiochus IV. He is not successful at maintaining the temple. Okay, He's successful at defiling it, but then it's taken back. His son, Antiochus IV, uh, V, is not successful at retaking the temple and neither is Demetrius the first. Demetrius the first was the one who was in Rome as a hostage who was exchanged by his father to get Antiochus the fourth out of Rome. Remember, Demetrius the first, his father, is the older brother of Antiochus the fourth. So he gives his son to get his older or his younger brother out from Rome. Well, eventually Demetrius gets out from Rome he comes back and kills his cousin, Antiochus V, and he takes the position. Now, after his death comes Alexander Bullus. And Alexander, he has already seen how unsuccessful the Grecian army has been. And when he takes command, he decides to make a treaty. He decides to give Israel their freedom. All right. In the year 142 BC, after more than 500 years of subjugation, the Jews were again masters of their own fate. Okay, so they're masters of their own fate. The temple is up and running. All right, they're doing the offerings. They're following Torah in many ways, but the high priest is illegitimate. It's not a correct high priest from the line of Zudot. Now, you have the Qumran community that claims they are from the line of Zudok, and so you have people who are eligible. You also have Onias the third's son, Onias the fourth. He's over in Egypt, okay? And there is a Jewish community over there, and Onias the fourth builds a temple unto Yah. Okay, now he's from the correct line. He's from the line of Zadok, so he is legitimately one that qualifies to be a high priest, but what does he do over there in Leon Topolis? Over there in Egypt, he builds a temple to Yah, but it's over a pagan temple. All right, so he builds this somewhat smaller replica, in a sense, of Jerusalem's temple. Uh, it was nothing grandiose or anything like over in Jerusalem, but it was a temple dedicated to Yah. And Ananias the fourth and the Jewish community there start doing offerings. They start obeying the Torah. Uh, in many ways, but again, this temple's built not by permission of Yah, nor is it in the place where Yah said he wants his name to uh, be known, and it's built over a pagan temple. So there are a lot of issues over there with that temple, but you do have Jews over there worshiping there, 
And that temple will last far past the resurrection of Yeshua. That will last many, many decades after the destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem. So when it says that Yeshua and Yosef and Miriam went to Egypt because Herod was going to kill the babies and Yosef takes his family there, some speculate on whether he might have gone to Alexandria, Egypt, or he might have gone over here where the temple was in Leon Topolis. Right? And that is roughly 25 um, meters, I think is what the uh, historical document I read said, uh, north of Cairo. All right, today it's known as Cairo. So Leon Topolis is north of Cairo, just to kind of give you a picture on where that temple was. All right, so much later, a man named Jonathan, still of Hasmonean dynasty, became king and high priest in the year 103 BC and was named Alexander Janaeus. Alexander Janaeus did the king thing and launched campaigns of expansions against Judean neighbors. He's doing the whole circumcision, forced proselytization thing. He's expanding the borders, okay? Although he was a Pharisee, he allied himself with the aristocrat Sadducees and showed contempt for the Pharisees. So this gentleman was a Pharisee, but he began to side with the Sadducees. He is king now. He has the power. So he puts down the sect of the Pharisees, all their laws, all their ways, and he allows the Sadducees to run things. They are the religious leaders now. Okay, this is going to be a constant battle, all right? And it was they were battling this before Alexander Janaeus takes over, okay? The sect of the Pharisees and the sect of the Sadducees had grown uh, through the Maccabean Revolt to become both sides pretty powerful, and they began to jockey for the power over the people, all right? And so when we get here to 103 B.C., We've got now a king supporting the Sadducees. And so now they are the supreme rulers while he is king. All right, and this precipitated an uprise against him and another civil war. See, what you're hap happening is between the Maccabean revolt and the time of Yeshua, you're going to have some civil wars going on between Jews, jockeying for the authority over the people. They're going to have civil wars, more than one. This is one of them. All right, a civil war breaks out. The Pharisees made an alliance with the Seleucid monarchy in Syria. The Seleucid monarch sent an army of both Syrians and Jews southward to overthrow Janaeus, but the Jews who came south deserted and joined Janaeus' forces. So there's an abandonment there. Janaeus crushed the rebellion against him and took revenge against the Pharisees. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, in the year 88 BC, Janaeus had 800 of the rebels cru crucified. He watched some of the crucifixions from a window while dining with his harem, and in front of the crucified, he had the throats of their wives and children cut. The executions helped to make Alexander Janaeus unpopular. He became unpopular among the people because of these crucifixions. Remember, it's never looked upon favorably when Jews are crucifying or killing Jews. The people are going to turn against you, all right? But you do have this civil war going on where the Pharisees and the Sadducees do not like each other, even to the point of fighting to the death. An attempt to improve matters followed the death of Alexander Janaeus at the age of 37 in 76 BC. Alexander Janaeus was succeeded by his widow, Salomoe uh, Alexandria, or Salome. Some might pronounce it Salome. Salome Alexandria, all right. As queen of Judea or Judah, she reversed the policies of her late husband and supported the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, in turn, recognized her right to rule even though she was not a descendant of David, as they believed a monarch should be. So notice, hey, if she's going to help support us, we're going to help support her be queen, all right? Now, some might say she was the only queen ever of Judah, 
and there is another lady that some speculate would be also a queen. So there possibly were two queens of Judah, um, but definitely she was placing herself in that position. Her husband left it to her, but she reversed his policies, gave power to the Pharisees, the Pharisees. Now, this is very important because by the time we get to Yeshua, the Pharisees are more powerful than the Sadducees. Okay, when it comes to the Sanhedrin, you are going to have it mainly being run by the Pharisees, by the Pharisees. All right. Now, now just because the Pharisees, the Pharisees are given authority by the queen there. This is not going to end the fighting. The fighting is going to consist uh, between the Sadducees and the Parashim. Now, when it comes down to about 63 BC, Rome is going to step in. Rome takes over Judea in 63 BC and becomes now the ruling empire again over Israel. And when I mean again, I mean another foreign nation is now ruling over the nation of Israel. Okay, Israel. Uh, after Judea lost its independence, some Jews there turned from hope in a great new Israel ruled by a king such as David. And they began to look forward toward individual salvation. Among them were the Essenes. They were offended by the acceptance of foreign ways by fellow Jews and by the collaboration with Rome, Roman rule by the aristocrats and their priests, the Sadducees. So we have all this going on where Rome takes over. They start placing, of course, who they want in as high priest. It's still going to now be a position that is bought and sold. Also, shortly here, the Romans are going to put King Herod in, begin to call him king, king of the Jews. They are going to oust the Hasmonean dynasty. The Hasmonean dynasty is going to cease at this time. And so now we have the Romans leading up to the time of Yeshua in charge, oppressing the people. All right. The Sadducees are able to run the temple grounds area. The Parashim, the Pharisees, stay in control of the large majority of the people. They have the greatest influence still in the Sanhedrin. Now, when Yeshua is born, Hillel is in charge of the Sanhedrin. Okay, Rabbi Hillel uh, had a rabbinical school, and then you also had a rabbinical school called the House of Shammai. So you have the House of Hillel and the House of Shammai. The time of Yeshua's birth, the House of Hillel is in charge, or at least he is president of the Sanhedrin at this. So he has, his school has the most influence on the people, uh, on the temple area, because even though the Sadducees were officiating, the temple grounds, the Pharisees had the favor of the people. So that was heavily influenced on what the Sadducees did. Okay. So Hillel is running things until 10 CE. 10 CE, he dies. And then the school of Shammai takes over and they become more powerful. The Shammai becomes president of the Sanhedrin. And it is that school that is often challenging Yeshua when Yeshua rises to the point where he begins his ministry. He begins his ministry um, in the late 20s, early 30s CE. He does it for three and a half years. It's the school of Shammai that gives him the most trouble. Okay, They are the heavy hitters there in the land of Judea over a lot of other sects of Pharisees. They weren't the only sect of Pharisees. You have the Galilean Pharisees. You have many other branches of Judaism uh, within the area, but the school of Shammai is the most powerful group at that time. So then we have the death and resurrection of Yeshua, and the school of Shammai will still exist until the destruction of the temple. When the destruction of the temple happens in 70 CE, the school of Shammai will begin to lose their grip slowly. The school of Hillel will uh, exist beyond the destruction of the temple. They will be the ones that mainly meet at a place called Yavne in the land of Judea, and they will get support of the Romans. 
to continue and birth what is now called rabbinical Judaism. So that is kind of the history uh, that will give you a little bit of the atmosphere and understanding of what kind of place it was when Yeshua comes on the scene. When Yeshua comes on the scene, we have the parashim that are very heavy hitters that are putting a heavy weight on the people. You've got the school of Shammai, which this school is very strict. They're, they're super conservative. They're not like the school of Hillel that is more relaxed. And they have a heavy burden placed on the people through their oral law. The Romans are oppressing them through taxes and just abuse. Uh, killing Jews along the way that try to rebel. You have little rebellions, uh, rebellious um, squamishes that spur up and then get squashed by the Romans. At this time, they are looking for a Messiah. And every Hanukkah comes, they are looking for another Judah Maccabee to come. There is this great anticipation of the Messiah from the seed of David who will come and free them from the Romans, free them from the oppression of the parashim and the corruption of the priesthood. And every Hanukkah, there's this great anticipation of this coming. So now we have led ourselves up to uh, this time. We want to look at real quickly, Daniel chapter nine. Let's go to Daniel chapter nine, because as I have said many times, without a Hanukkah, there could not be a Yeshua. There could not be a savior. And one of the scriptures that Yeshua is going to fulfill, he needs the temple up and running in order for him to fulfill this prophetic passage. So let's go ahead and go there. Go to Daniel chapter 9, verse, starting with verse 25. Okay, we are here in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. It states, so know and understand, from the issuing of the decree to restore and to build Jerusalem until the time Mashiach. The prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. All right, so the timing needs to be calculated for one. So the timing when Yeshua comes is perfect, of course. It's according to Yah's timing. And it also states here, it will be rebuilt with plaza and moat, but it will be in times of distress. Well, the second temple was built in a very stressful time. Right? We don't have time to get into that history, but there was a lot of issues that went on. It wasn't something that uh, the Jewish people came over, Ezra and Nehemiah, they just came over and built it real fast and no problem. No, there was a lot of issues that were happening. So Then after the 62 weeks, Mashiach will be cut off and have nothing. So this is when Yeshua is put to death after the 62 weeks. Then the prince, or the people of the prince, who is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So after the death of Yeshua, Mashiach, now there is this prince who is to come, which we know to be the Romans. They will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the temple has to be up and running, okay? For Yeshua to fulfill many of the commandments that he came to fulfill, and to also show us how to do them correctly, because he doesn't abolish the Torah. Okay, that term fulfill just means to rightly show us how to live it. And he also fulfills passages about himself so that he can be the one who died for our sins. He can be the one who uh, makes the payment for our sins. He can be the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He fulfills all those passages also. So there has to be a temple up and running for the Messiah to come and be able to do this. Well, he, he dies before the destruction of the temple. So this clearly shows that without a Hanukkah, number one, there wouldn't be Jews in the land because the Greek empire would have won, all Jews would have assimilated, no more circumcision, and after several generations, there would be no Jews in the land. And the Messiah would not be able to come. Okay, no Torah in the land. The temple, uh, would have either been totally destroyed or just turned into a pagan temple, amen, like it was uh, during the time of the Maccabean revolt. So just from my perspective, my opinion, without a Hanukkah, there is no Messiah. One of the reasons why I celebrate Hanukkah, not only, only do I believe that Yeshua gave them the great victory, so it's worth celebrating because 
Father Yah is staying faithful to the covenant of Abraham, even though the people have become faithless in many ways, the remnant, he's saving the nation for the remnant's sake, right? It's a mighty act of Father Yahweh. It's a mighty act of Yeshua to stay faithful to the covenant. And Yeshua is making sure the temple is up and running when he comes. So yes, I'm going to celebrate Hanukkah with great joy, giving all glory and praise and honor to Yeshua and to the Father. Amen. And now Yeshua is even during the time he is here on earth, he's going to make a very important announcement during the time of Hanukkah. He's going to choose this time to make a special declaration. So let's go ahead and go to Yochanan, John chapter 10. So here we are in Yochanan, John chapter 10, starting with verse 22. Some of your Bibles will say Feast of Dedication. Some of them might say Festival of Lights. Uh, my particular version says Hanukkah. And then came Hanukkah. It was winter in Jerusalem. Yeshua was walking in the temple around Solomon's colonnade. This is a place where a lot of rabbis would do their teachings. If they wanted to teach their students in that, this would be the area a lot of times they would go. Then the Judean leaders surrounded him, saying, How long will you hold us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us outright. Well, of course, if, if he's truly the Messiah, this is the time to tell us. Because it's during the time of Hanukkah, the people are always anticipating a Judah of Maccabee to come. Of course, the Perishim, the Pharisees were waiting for a Judah of Maccabee to come and free them and bring in world peace. And so they are trying to trap him. Okay, they're trying to disqualify him as Messiah. They're trying to force him to stumble upon himself so that all the people can see he's not the one you're waiting for. But does that happen to Yeshua? Let's go ahead and read. Yeshua answered them, I told you, but you don't believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify concerning me. That should be enough. The works that he's doing in his Father's name should testify that he is the Mashiach, that he is the long-awaited Messiah. But you don't believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one, and in the Greek, it literally says, I and the Father, we are one. Again, the Judean leaders pick stones, pick up stones to stone him. Yeshua answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? The Judean leaders answered, we are not stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. For though you are a man, you make yourself God. All right. So they know exactly what his claim is here. When he says that I and the Father, we are one, they know exactly he is claiming to be on equal grounds and to do works that only the Father can do. He is placing himself in a position on equal grounds with the Father. He's not just some shaliach, he's not just some representative that comes, that's what shaliach means, it's like a representative that comes in the name of another person, but it's, they really don't have that same abilities and everything because they're not that person, but they're coming in that person's name, so they carry that weight and that authority. No, he's literally going much deeper than that. When he says, I and the Father, we are one, he's saying, I have the power to do everything the Father does. I have the same authority, same power, same anointing. He's putting himself on equal grounds. This is more than a shaliach. This goes beyond that. Okay, that's why they're picking up stones to stone him. If he was just some representative, some ambassador or something, they would know that. But he is crossing the line with his words here because of what he is saying. Now, it's very important. We're going to need to go and look. He's actually quoting some verses from the Tanakh. He's referring to, it's called a Kesher in Hebrew, where he 
takes some Tanakh verses and he pulls them together and he gives them to himself. Okay. What it is saying of the Father, it is also saying of me because we are one. Okay. And this we are one is the ability only something the Father can do. So it's it's placing him again on an equal footing ground with the Father, which is why they're picking up stones. They wouldn't pick up stones if he was just some type of ambassador, a shaliach. Okay, they would fully recognize and understand that, oh, he's just coming as an ambassador. No, they understand he's taking it to a level uh, that is um, to them too far. Okay, so first let's go to the passages that are being spoken of, and then we're going to talk about some other things. So let's go ahead and go to Deuteronomy. 3239. Deuteronomy 3239. And what I want you to focus in and hone in on is with verse 25 through 30. Let's read it again real quick before we go. Yeshua answered them, I told you, but you don't believe the works I do in my father's name. Testify concerning me. But you don't believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. All right, so he, they're not part of the flock, okay? I know them and they follow me. I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Very, very important because these attributes um, and abilities are gonna only be the father is the one that's supposed to have these but Yeshua is claiming I have them. So let's go ahead and go to Deuteronomy 32:39. Deuteronomy 32:39 says and this is Yah speaking, see now that I, I am he. There are no other Elohim besides me. I give death and give life. I have wounded but I will heal and none can rescue from my hand. Notice the correlation there. Only Yah gives life. Well, what did Yeshua say? He says he gives life. He is the one that gives eternal life. He is going to be the source of eternal life. Well, that's only something reserved for Yahweh. Well, it's reserved for the Son because the Son is of the same nature and essence. He is also Yahweh. So Yeshua can say this. He's not just a shaliach. He is of the same nature and essence as the Father. And this uh, verse here in 39 is speaking of Yahweh. Yahweh is the one that will bring death and give life. Well, who's going to be the judge, the ultimate judge of all creation? It is going to be Yeshua. Amen. Yeshua is going to be judge. How can he be this judge and fulfill the scripture? He is Yah. Though distinct and separate from the Father, he is of the same nature. Right? He says, I wounded, but I will heal. Well, Yeshua is the one judging, and he is the one healing. And none can rescue from my hands. Okay, This is speaking of Yahweh. And this very phrase is also being now spoken of the Son, Yeshua. Let's also go to Psalm 95. Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7, will also share similar to what we have been just sharing. So Psalm 95, six and seven, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Yahweh, our maker, for he is our Elohim and we are the people of his pasture. Remember, Yeshua says that the sheep hear my voice, okay? He is the shepherd. And this is being spoken of as Yahweh's pasture and Yahweh's sheep. They are the flock of his hand. Okay. They are the flock of Yahweh's hand. Well, what does Yeshua say? They're the flock of his hand. He's putting himself on equal ground as the father. And the works that he's doing is showing that he holds equal ground to the father. He's not just an ambassador or a shaliach. He is on equal grounds with the father. They, we, are one, okay, meaning no distinction between the two.
So back in Yochanan, chapter 10, starting with verse 25 again, we're going to reread this a little bit and then carry on. This is an amazing announcement here. Yeshua, they tried to pressure him. Not only is he claiming to be the Mashiach, the Messiah, but he's taking it a step further and saying, hey, I am a, I'm doing exactly the same things the Father has been promised to do. We are one. So verse 26, but you don't believe because you are not my sheep. Okay, remember, talking about the flock, Yahweh's flock. And Yeshua is calling them my sheep, not the father's sheep, but my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. Well, they're the sheep of Yahweh. That's not something a shaliach would do. A shaliach or an ambassador would not claim personally those are my sheep. Okay. If he just came in the authority of the father, he still can't call them his sheep. They are the father's sheep. He's just the representative. All right, that's over overlooking them. Now, Yeshua is calling them his sheep. He can only do that if he's on equal plane with the Father, which is why they're picking up stones to stone him. He says, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. He doesn't say, I give them eternal life through, uh, through the Father or whatnot. He's saying he's the source. He is the source of eternal life. Okay, only the Father is the source of life, as we saw in Deuteronomy 32, 39. So he says, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father, we are one. All right, the Father is greater by position. A difference in position does not necessarily mean a difference in nature when it comes to who? The uncreated, infinite Yahweh. That's very, very important. He's not on equal grounds as humanity. Humanity is finite and limited. One in person, one in being. That's the way Yahweh created man. That's the way he created all his created beings. One in person, one in being. But when it comes to Yahweh, he's uncreated and infinite. He's higher and greater than a finite created being. It's not one in person equals one in being. He's not limited in that manner. The uncreated infinite Yahweh can be one in being and yet more than one individual or person. These are just finite terms that we are using to express the infinite uncreated Yahweh. So Yeshua is doing something very unique here. Yes, the Father is greater in position, but not greater in nature or essence. He's doing the exact same works that the, Father, that the Scriptures say the Father will do. Amen. And so when he came and emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, taking coming in the likeness of men, now he's receiving that authority and that uh, permission from the Father to do all these things. He's acting in a, hum a humble way as a servant. That's what he's trying to show us. He doesn't cease being Yahweh. That's why he can still do the things that Father Yah has called him to do. He's still divine, but he's not operating in certain attributes and manners on his own accord. Okay, He's humbled himself and become a servant to the Father, allowing the Father to be greater than him in position, amen? And I believe that was the way it always was. He was always greater in position because Yeshua always existed as the son, okay? Then he came on here into the earth, took on human flesh, and then he takes on the name Yeshua. He wasn't always known as Yeshua, right? He was always known as the son, but not always as Yeshua. That comes through his incarnation, okay? But we have this, um, this is just amazing. At Hanukkah time, he's announcing he's the Messiah, which everyone is waiting for the Messiah to come, right? So he is uh, doing that at Hanukkah time, and he's announcing his deity, which is why the Judeans, our leaders, are picking up stones to stone him, okay? Now, let's go on because the Judeans are going to press him harder, and he's going to drive home the point that he is divine. He's going to drive it home. So the Judean leaders answered, 
we aren't stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. Though you are a man, you make yourself God. Yeshua answered them, isn't it written in your writings? Some versions have Torah. Isn't it written in your Torah? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him, the one the father set apart and sent into the world? You speak blasphemy because I said I am the son of Elohim, the son of God. If I don't do the works of my father, don't believe me. But if I do, even if you trust me, I mean, I'm sorry, even if you don't trust me, trust the deeds. Then they came, I'm sorry, then you may come to know and continue to understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. He's reiterating, we are one. Okay. He's stating the father is in me and I am in the Father. Therefore, they tried to capture him again because he escaped from their hand. He reiterates his deity even more, which makes them angry. They know what he's saying. They know he's declaring deity, and he, they try to capture him, but he doesn't allow them to take him captive. He escapes their hand. So what, is, what does it mean that he drove home the fact that he is deity? Well, it's all within what he said here. Starting with verse 34, Yeshua answered them, isn't it written in your writings or your Torah? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, do you say of him, the one the father set apart and sent into the world, you blaspheme because I said I am the son of God? Now this is a direct quote from Psalm 82. Psalm 82 is a very important set of passages that we need to go to and read to help show and drive home the point what Yeshua was trying to do here on the, or during the time of Hanukkah. He's trying to drive home the point of his deity. So let's go ahead and go to Psalm 82 and read it in its context. It's eight verses long. All right, so here we are in Psalm 82. Let's go ahead and begin with verse one. It says, a Psalm of Asaph. Now, the original language says, Elohim takes his stand in the council of El. So Elohim obviously is Yahweh here, and takes his stand in the council or the divine council or assembly of El, of Yahweh. So he takes his place, okay, in the divine council here. He judges among the Elohim. Now, he judges among the Elohim. We have to look at this word Elohim, and we're going to have to uh, settle the debate, because there is a debate that the term Elohim can refer to human beings, all right? And my stance is it cannot. The term Elohim is never used for human beings that are alive here on earth, okay? What this assembly is here, I believe, is one in the heavenlies. It's a divine council that Yahweh has set up where he has created divine beings there that are part of his assembly, that he has a divine council with, all right? He has placed certain divine beings over the nations, okay? We see this a lot in Daniel, all right? Now, Daniel um, states that the angel Michael is the prince that watches over Israel, okay, in Daniel chapter 12. And also we have an angel that is bringing a report back to Daniel, and he's delayed 21 days because of the prince of Persia. He had to battle the prince of Persia, Persia in the spiritual realm. So there are spiritual divine beings that are over the nations, and their goal and purpose that Yah gave them was to teach everyone correctly the ways of Yah. But what does he say? He's judging among the Elohim. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? So these divine beings are doing wicked things to the nations. They are not teaching them the ways of Yah, the ways of Yahweh. They are showing them the ways of wickedness. 
Okay, so this is where we get the nations serving and worshiping pagan gods, pagan Elohim. They're actually real divine beings to the human beings, they're gods. Okay, but these are fallen, created, finite Elohim who are still all under the authority of Yahweh. So they are divine beings in the spiritual realm who are teaching the ways of the nation wickedness, okay? And now Yah is judging them for it. He's passing judgment on them. What he wants them to do is verse three. He wants them to give justice to the poor and the fatherless, be just to the afflicted and the destitute, rescue the weak and needy, deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk in darkness. They walk about in darkness. All of the earth's foundations are shaken. See, there is one thought that these judges, these Elohim, might be Israelite judges, the elders, but this would be false because all of the earth's foundations are shaken by what these Elohim are doing. Okay. And these Elohim are teaching the ways of wickedness to the people. But let's, let's look a little bit more. This will help show that they're not human judges of Israel. He says, I said, you are Elohim, and you are sons, all sons of Elion. Yet you will die like men and will fall like any of the princes. See, they're going to die like men. They're not, they're divine beings. You would not say that if it was just an elder or a human being or a human prince of Israel. And what Israel does affects Israel. This is talking about all the earth's foundations are shaken. Why? Because it's the nations that are being taught wickedly by the divine beings. This has nothing to do with the elders of Israel. Okay, so this is a mistaken reading of that. These are divine beings. Verse 7 makes it clear for me, yet you will die like men and will fall like any of the princes. In other words, when Yeshua judges them, they're going to be thrown in the lake of fire just like, just like the humans are who are wicked and evil and get judged and thrown out of the kingdom. Amen. So these divine beings are the ones that are being spoken of here. So he says, I said, you are Elohim. This is the direct quote from Yeshua, right? I said, you are Elohim. You have to know who he's speaking to. He's speaking to divine beings in the spiritual realm. Now, when you do a study on Elohim, you will see that it, Elohim is more like a name given of a location of these beings. Okay. Anytime we see the word Elohim being used, it's usually, well, it's always, I shouldn't say usually, it's always used of a being in the spiritual realm. So it can be referring to pagan gods, it can be called Elohim, demons can be called Elohim, angels, Malak, messengers of Yah are called Elohim, and Yahweh himself is called an Elohim. Now, you will see a human being called an Elohim, which is Samuel, but only when he has already been dead and gone on into the spiritual realm. So when Saul calls, to the witch and wants to conjure up the spirit of Samuel, he's in the spiritual realm. This is when he's called an Elohim. He's never called an Elohim before that. So nowhere in the Bible will you see the term Elohim being referred to as human beings or human judges. It will always be referring to those in the spiritual realm. Now, real quickly, there is a passage in Deuteronomy 32 that we need to help clarify this so that when we get back to the words of Yeshua, you will see this, um, this point of him claiming to be deity, that, that point being driven home. So let's go ahead and go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. All right, I have here Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9. Verses eight and nine. Now, all of our Bibles that we have today, uh, or at least most of them, I should say, come from the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is the bottom one here in the slide. 
And the bottom one states, now this Masoretic text is from like the ninth and 10th century, okay, after Yeshua, okay, after the resurrection. So this is CE, ninth, 10th century is where these manuscripts come from, CE. And it states, when Elion gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all the sons of men, he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of Israel. For Yahweh's portion was his people, Yaakov was the lot of his inheritance. Now, there's a problem here because when did he set the borders? When did he set the nations up? Okay. Well, the only logical time in the Bible we see that is during the time of Babylon. When he scatters the nations and they get scattered across the earth, he sets up their borders. Okay. And Israel's not even in existence yet. Israel's not even a nation yet. And so this reading here seems to be questionable. All right. Now we have manuscripts from the Septuagint. Now the Septuagint here, the Torah Septuagint was written right around 256 BC before Yeshua. So this is before Yeshua is even born. We have the LXX here, right in the middle. And it says, when the Most High divided the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. And his people, Yaakov, became the portion of the Lord. Israel was the line of his inheritance. So it's set up according to the number of the angels, not the number of the sons of Israel, but the angels because angels are set over the nations, okay, to guard over them, and their job duty was to teach them about Yahweh, but that's not what all of them did. They became fallen, okay? So this clearly, the sages and uh, translators here that were in Alexandria, Egypt, translating the, the Hebrew into Greek, they chose angels of God here. And they were taking it from the Hebrew. Now we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is at least 100 years before Yeshua. And it's in the Hebrew writings. It's in Hebrew. Um, it states from the Dead Sea Scrolls, their Hebrew of Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. When Elion gave the nations as an inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of Elohim. For Yah's portion was his people. Jacob was the lot of his inheritance. So we have sons of Elohim. Well, how did, how did the sages in Alexandria, Egypt, who translated the Hebrew into Greek for all the people, take that? They took that as Malach, angels. The idea of Elohim being angelic beings, people in the spiritual realm or created beings in the spiritual realm, was the common thought. And so it makes no sense to set up the boundaries of the nations according to the sons of Israel when they're not even in existence. Amen. And it still makes no sense, but it makes a lot of sense if it's according to the sons of Elohim who are angelic beings who Yah wants to place over the nations. And now he's judging them in Psalm 82 for not doing righteous things with the people, for not teaching them the ways of righteousness. So this makes perfect sense and aligns. And this is very important because Yeshua is quoting Psalm 82. And we have to understand Psalm 82 in its proper context. They are talking about divine beings there. So let's go ahead and go back now to Yochanan, John chapter 10. So here we are back in Yochanan, John chapter 10, verse 34. All right, remember, they're already trying to stone him. They're already trying to uh, kill him for claiming to be equal with God. All right, Yeshua is not denying it. He's actually going to drive home the point that he is exactly what they think. And they really can't do anything about it. But let's read. Verse 34, Yeshua answered them, isn't it written in your writings, I have said you are God's. That's Psalm. 82, who is he talking about? Those evil divine beings, those rulers who are being judged, they're wicked. 
if he called them Elohim, to whom the word of God came, what was the word of God that came to them? Judgment. There was going to be judgment. They're going to die like men and fall like princes. Okay. They are divine beings. All right. And it says, and the scripture cannot be broken. Okay. He, it's saying that about them. Do you say of him, the one, I'm sorry, do you say of him, the one the father set apart and sent into the world? He's talking about pre existence here. The one the father set apart and sent into the world, because you're already in the conversation of divine beings. So, do you say of him, Yeshua speaking of himself, the one the Father set apart and sent into the world, you speak blasphemy because I said I am son of God, son of Elohim? He's talking about himself as a divine being. And what kind of divine being was he actually stating when he says son of God? Well, the context, all right? where it says, the Father and I, we are one. And they pick up stones to stone him. So he's driving home the point that he is divine, that he is who he says he is. If they get, can be called Elohim, and these are wicked rulers, wicked judges, not doing the work of the Father. What is Yeshua doing? He's doing the perfect work of the Father. And they've got nothing against him they can't bring an accusation against him because every work he does is what the father said he would do for the people and now he has declared himself as messiah and what one with the father so if they can be called gods who are wicked and evil and receive that judgment whom the word of god came to and scripture can't be broken how can they call Yeshua a blasphemer when he's doing the work of Father Yah perfectly, claiming to be one with the Father? He's divine. That's the whole point on driving home here. The issue is, oh, you want to stone me? Let me, let me, I'm not going to deny what you're thinking. I'm going to drive home the point, which is going to make you more angry, and you're going to want to capture me even the more. That's why he says, if I don't do the works of the Father, of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do, even if you don't trust me, trust the deeds. Then you may know, come to know, and continue to understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. He's claiming deity, divinity here, not just a shaliach, not just a representative. He could have easily cleared the air up. If he if that's all he was, but no, he makes them even angrier than what they were because they were really telling the truth. He was claiming to be equal with Father Yah as far as essence and nature, as far as doing the deeds. He has that ability, he has that authority because he is Yahweh in nature and essence. Amen. Though distinct and separate from the Father. So this is just a beautiful, beautiful set of scriptures being given at Hanukkah time of Yeshua claiming to be not only the Mashiach, the long-awaited Mashiach that everyone was waiting for at Hanukkah time, but divine. And it's easily proven through the scriptures here of his divinity, that that is what he's proclaiming. So this is something to celebrate. Hanukkah is an awesome time to celebrate the deity of Yeshua to celebrate the messiahship of Yeshua because it's a reflection Hanukkah as we've been constantly saying is a reflection of the shadow of the reality of things to come there still is a Hanukkah to come remember Antiochus the fourth and all that he did he was a type and a shadow of the anti-Mashiach that is to come so there are things we can learn from this and be aware of and be ready for because that um, those passages that Yeshua talks about in Matthew chapter 24 have not been fulfilled yet. All right, so let's go ahead and go there real quickly. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. All right, here we are in Matthew chapter 24. Yeshua is going to go on and tell them to beware of 
uh, many people coming in his name. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be famines and earthquakes still to come. Okay. All right. Many believers in Yeshua are going to be handed over to the nations and persecuted for believing in him. Okay. Many false prophets are going to lead many astray. And the uh, because of lawlessness, which means Torahlessness, the love of many is going to grow cold. All right. And this is going to continue until the good news is proclaimed throughout all the world. And then in verse 15, he states, So when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one on the roof must go, uh, must not go down to take what is in his house. And the one in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your escape will not happen in the winter during Hanukkah time or on a Shabbat. For then there will be great trouble such as not happened since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. This is a future Hanukkah to come. Okay, the abomination of desolation is when the anti-Mashiach sets himself up in the temple as God to be worshiped as God, amen. Uh, he will um, take away the Torah, okay? He will look to change what? Times and seasons and law. That's what the scripture says. Well, that law is Torah. It's not secular law. There's no big deal about changing the secular laws. They change all the time. What is never supposed to change is Torah. And so this time and event that Yeshua is speaking of is still one to happen in the future. The Maccabean revolt was a shadow of it, but it wasn't it. Otherwise, Yeshua would not be talking about this abomination of desolation still to come. So the Maccabean revolt was a shadow, but the reality is still to come. And it will be devastating. And yes, pray that your escape will not happen in the winter or on Shabbat. So he's already talking about Shabbat. Shabbat should be still kept, right? It's still part of the law, okay? So he's still expecting it to be done in the future, all right? Now, the anti-Mashiach is going to try and take all the Torah away and persecute those who follow it, just like Antiochus IV did. So it's extremely important. And they're not going to see Yeshua until what? They ought to cry something out. Let's go to Let's go to uh, Matthew 23. Let's back up a chapter real quick. So in Matthew 23, 37 through 39, O Yerushalayim, O Yerushalayim, who kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I long to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. This is Yeshua speaking. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will never see me again until you say Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Adonai, or Yahweh. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. They're going to need this other Hanukkah to happen because it's going to cause the nation of Israel to cry out and realize Yeshua was the Messiah, and they're going to cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. When they cry that out, Yeshua will come. But we have this Hanukkah still to come in the future, All right? Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 11, let's go down here real quick. Daniel 11, chap, uh, chapter 11, verse 31, his forces will rise up and profane the fortified temple. They will stop the daily offering and set up the abomination of desolation. This abomination of desolation is setting up this statue or setting up this image okay in the holy place not only that the anti-mashiach will claim to be god that's what antiochus did he claimed to be epiphanies god manifest he turned out to be a madman and so will this future anti-mashiach turn out to be a madman right but he had the statue of zeus placed up in the temple okay and they had to worship zeus and do uh, offerings there uh, towards Zeus, okay? 
all of that is going to happen again, but it's going to happen towards this anti-Mashiach in the future. He's going to set up this image in the temple. All right. When the destruction of the temple happened in 70 CE, there was no statue there. Nero and all of them, they didn't get a statue put up in the temple area. All right. The abomination of desolation did not happen in 70 CE. It's still to come. It's still to come. And Yeshua, by his proclamation, made, you, made sure you knew that the Hanukkah that happened during the time of Antiochus IV was not the reality. It was a foreshadow, but the reality is still to come. So there's just so much that Yeshua shares and points to on why we need to continue to celebrate Hanukkah. It's very beneficial. Is it a sin not to? No, it's not. If you decide that you don't want to celebrate it, it's not a sin. Okay. But I think you're missing out on some historical facts about, about Yahweh and his plan for his people and his kingdom and what Yeshua did and proclaimed. And so it, it is an accurate time. This is the time of Kislev right now. And we're coming up to Kislev 25. It's an accurate historical event that happens. And Yeshua, I believe, celebrated it. He gave them the victory. He's announcing his deity there in Jerusalem during the time of Hanukkah. There's nothing he ever speaks out against this tradition. He doesn't warn people to stop doing it. Um, and he is a Torah observant Jew who would have followed many traditions. Okay. Some traditions, no. Some that violate the Torah, he would not have followed. But traditions that uplifted his mission and Father Yahweh, sure he would. And that's what Hanukkah does. It helps to uplift a work and a miracle that Father Yah gave to Israel, and I believe Yeshua did too. Now, the final thing before we close is some people will say, well, were the Jews, I mean, were they looking for a divine Messiah at that time? Or is that some type of invention that comes later on in Christianity, you know, in the fourth century during Constantine's time, he invents this thing called the Trinity. Now, during the first century, there was a lot of discussion about a divine Messiah. They also had discussions about what is called the two powers in heaven. Okay, because they saw in the Tanakh, they often saw a visible Yahweh showing up in the, in the form of a messenger of Yahweh. Um, different passages show that Yahweh is showing his visible self to the people, and they are in shock, and they, are, they know he's Yahweh. Okay, uh, But they also talk about an invisible Yahweh. They know that Yahweh can also not be seen. He's a spirit. He's uh, beyond you know, creation. And so there was this talk within Judaism, because there wasn't one Judaism, there were Judaisms, but there is this talk of two powers in heaven that we have evidence of through scholarly work that uh, there were Jews that were looking for a divine human Messiah. So this claim that Yeshua is claiming, it seems inimaginable, but it was thought to be possible in the first century. So I want to show you some scholarship that helps share this truth, and then we'll go ahead and end our time together. All right, so we have here Dr. Alan Siegel. Now, Dr. Alan Siegel is a, um, he's, a he's an ethnic Jew who does not believe in the divinity of Yeshua or that he's Messiah, but he did scholarly work on the two powers in heaven. The evidence that was there in the first century shows that this discussion was going on. So he was trying to see exactly where all this began and to what depth was it given. And he states here in his book, Two Powers, page 163, there were others in Philo's day, Philo is before Yeshua comes, who spoke of a second God, but who were not as careful as Philo in defining the limits of that term. In other words, Philo saw this other Yahweh, he called him the Lagos, right? a visible manifestation in human figure, often throughout the Tanakh. Um, in the Aramaic, it was called the Membra of Yahweh. The Membra of Yahweh in Aramaic, in the Targums, was known as a divine figure of Yahweh manifesting himself in front of his people. And so Philo, though, thought it was a created being. 
He thought this other Yahweh, the second God, was a created being. But what Dr. Alan Siegel is saying is people in the first century, they went beyond Philo. Okay, they weren't so careful in defining the limits of that term. Okay, the term that Philo uses is Lagos, right? But there were some Jews that said, yeah, he's the, there's a Lagos, but he's of the same nature as the invisible Yahweh. So he's, it's a great book to read and study. Now, he is not a believer in Yeshua, and so you will not see him in favor of declaring Yeshua as Messiah and deity. Okay? But he's just giving you factual information about what was going on in the first century prior to Yeshua coming. Now. Dr. Michael Heiser wrote a review on the book. He thought the book was excellent. And his review, uh, he is a believer in Yeshua and his deity. And so here we're going to read his review of the book. The ancient Israelites knew two Yahweh, one invisible, a spirit, the other visible, often in human form. The two Yahwehs at times appear together in the text, at times being distinguished at other times not. Early Judaism understood this portrayal and its rationale. There was no sense of a violation of monotheism since either figure was indeed Yahweh. There was no second distinct God running the affairs of the cosmos. During the second temple period, Jewish theologians and writers speculated on an identity for the second Yahweh. Guesses ranged from the divinized humans from the stories of the Hebrew Bible to exalted angels. These speculations were not considered unorthodox. That acceptance changed when certain Jews, the early Christians, connected Jesus with this orthodox Jewish idea. This explains why these Jews, the first converts to following Jesus the Christ, could simultaneously worship the God of Israel and Jesus and yet refuse to acknowledge any other God. Jesus was the incarnate second Yahweh. In response, as Siegel's work demonstrated, Judaism pronounced the two power teaching a heresy sometime in the second century. So Dr. Siegel's work shows that in the second century, now this type of teaching of the two powers in heavens becomes heretical. And it is highly likely because of the response of those Jewish believers now declaring Yeshua as Messiah and divine. And so what, what wasn't heresy now becomes heresy in order to, in their eyes, save the Jewish people, okay? Because they're not believers in Yeshua. So Dr. Alan Siegel has no problem calling the two powers in heaven theology her heretical. He would agree with the second century rabbis, but he also agrees it wasn't considered heretical when Yeshua came. Prior to his coming and during the time, he, it wasn't considered heretical. So now let's go to the Jewish Gospels, the story of the Jewish Christ. Daniel Boyarin, a Jewish scholar, he's not a believer in Yeshua as Messiah or his deity, but he will declare some factual statements that were in the first century, at least beliefs in the first century. So Daniel Boreen states, Jews that believe, Jews believe that God had a divine deputy or emissary or even son exalted above all the angels who function as an intermediary between God and the world in creation, revelation, and redemption. He states that on page five of his book, The Jewish Gospels. All right, on page five, he also says, though some Jews believe the Mashiach would be only human, many believed he would be only divine. And others believe the two were going to be one and the same, that Mashiach of David would be a divine redeemer. All right, he goes on to say on page six, many Israelites at the time of Jesus were expecting a Mashiach who would be divine and come to earth in the form of a human. Thus, the basic underlining thoughts from which the Trinity and incarnation grew are there in the very world in which Jesus was born and from which he was first written about in the Gospel of Mark and John. Now we have Jewish scholar, Dr. David Blusser, who also is not a believer in Yeshua, okay? Um, during his lifetime, now there is speculation that he became a believer towards the end of his life, but that's speculation. But he does state here in Jewish Sources in Earlier Christianity, his book, Jewish Sources in Early Christianity, on page 58 and 59, he states the sublime or divine conceptions of Christ the Messiah 
in the New Testament are, in most cases, not the direct result of Christian belief, but adaptations and modifications of Jewish beliefs, which were current in certain circles. And our finer, final Jewish scholar, Dr. Jacob Neusner, and he also is not a believer in Yeshua or his deity, but he will admit that they were looking for a divine Messiah in the first century. There were Jews that were looking for that. And he states, we focus upon how the system laid out in the Mishnah takes up and disposes of those critical issues of teleology worked out through messianic eschatology in other earlier versions of Judaism. These earlier systems resorted to the myth of the Messiah as savior and redeemer of Israel, a supernatural figure engaged in political historical tasks as king of the Jews, even a God-man facing the crucial historical questions of Israel's life and resolving them, the Christ as king of the world of the ages of death itself. So he fully admits, though he believes it was really a myth, but he admits that there were Jews that believed this. They were waiting for a supernatural figure, a God-man in the first century. And Yeshua came and he fulfilled that mission. Amen. John chapter 10, Yochanan chapter 10, helps drive home the point that Yeshua is divine and that he is the Mashiach. And he came during Hanukkah time to make that pronouncement. He allowed himself to be pressured and he brought forth that truth of his divinity and his Messiahship during the time of Hanukkah. Amen. So I hope you enjoyed our series here today. We are now have wrapped up our Hanukkah series. Um, I think it was a wonderful time together, bringing out the truth of Hanukkah, the history, and what Yeshua did during the time of Hanukkah. And I gave many, many reasons why I personally celebrate it and still do. Uh, so now we're going to go ahead and end with the ironic blessing. We're going to say it in Hebrew first, and then we'll say it in English. If you know it in Hebrew, go ahead and join in with me. Yevarechecha Yahweh ve'ishmerecha. Ya'er Yahweh pa'nav elecha ve'unika. Yisa Yahweh pa'nav elecha ve'asem lecha shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine to you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Shalom, everyone.